Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and the guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Today we have an interesting case that the United States Supreme Court has just taken as a, a case that will decide in its next term. It's called the United States versus Smith. It's an appeal from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Let's discuss it. So the way it works when you appeal to the Supreme Court, you file what's called a petition for a writ of certiorari. And a writ of certiorari is a writ that is directed to the 11th Circuit in this case saying, send up the record. And then the court reviews that record and usually issues an opinion. Well, you don't get that as a matter of right. The Supreme Court has to decide to take the case. And you get there by a petition for the writ and, of course, the opposing party, whether it's a civil matter, the defendant or the plaintiff, they get a right to respond. And of course, if it's the government, the government gets a right to respond. So today we're going to talk about this U.S. versus Smith case. The petitioner in this case, Timothy Smith, says this is the issue. Whether the proper remedy for the government's failure to prove venue is an acquittal barring reprosecution of the offense, as the Fifth and Eighth Circuits have held, or whether, instead, the government may retry the defendant for the same offense in a different venue as the Sixth, Ninth, Tenth, and Eleventh Circuits have held. That raises the issue of what is venue. We've probably all seen in some location somewhere a recitation of the word venue and, for example, you'll see it used to describe uh, concert halls. They held this in a big venue. But venue in the court system essentially means the place where the case is tried, and it has to be indexed to in a criminal case to where the offense was committed. So when they look at that, they look at where did the acts giving rise to the cause of action occur? And then each of those things has to be proved by a preponderance of the evidence, and in some cases, depending on um, the circuit precedent, maybe even to beyond a reasonable doubt, has to be proved. Uh, and then if for any reason the venue is improper, the person can't be tried there. Well, now one would think that this would make the government very careful that it would be certain to try people only where they could be tried. But because of this split in the circuits, the government gets a second bite at the apple in all of these additional circuits. Certainly some of the acts could be tied to Orlando, but most of the acts that occurred were at his keyboard and he did those all in Mobile, Alabama. It was up to the government to try him in the right venue, but they tried him in Pensacola and they secured convictions, and then he challenged those convictions at the 11th Circuit. And the 11th Circuit said, no, we're going to go with the majority of these other cases and hold that um, basically if you get tried in the wrong venue, the only thing that is available to you is we vacate the conviction, and then you're subject to retrial. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that there is an issue with the Fifth Amendment and not being twice put in double jeopardy. Or I should say, not being twice put in jeopardy. It's the double jeopardy provision. And the, the question then becomes, when does the double jeopardy conviction issue arise? Well, case law in all the circuits holds that it is the government's job to prove venue. And they have to do that. And if they don't prove venue, the problem is that some circuits approach this one way and other circuits approach it another. Let's look at what the a petitioner has said in this case. Criminal defendants have a right to be tried in a proper venue. Enumerated twice in the Constitution, that right was firmly established at the founding and has been safeguarded by this court for more than two centuries. But the courts of appeal are intractably divided over the appropriate remedy when a criminal defendant has been wrongly tried in an improper venue. 
The decision below exacerbates an acknowledged circuit conflict by holding that when the government fails to meet its burden of proving venue at trial, it is free to subject a defendant to a new trial in a different venue. That holding erodes venue protections that are deeply rooted in this nation's history and leaves the venue right dependent on the happenstance of where a defendant is tried. So with those words, the petitioner says, look, Supreme Court, you, you've got to resolve this circuit split. And then it tells them why it thinks it's important. The Magna Carta provided for certain protections with regard to where somebody could be tried. And unfortunately, as the petitioner indicates, this was not always honored. Prior to the American Revolution, the British strayed from this long-standing principle by threatening to force American colonists to stand trial in England. In 1769, Parliament responded to unrest in Massachusetts by decreeing that colonists charged with treason could be tried in England. This was a direct response to the failed prosecutions of rioters resisting the impositions of customs duties, which were thwarted by grand jurors sympathetic to the colonists' cause. Colonial governments swiftly and stridently objected to this measure as a deprivation of the inestimable privilege of being tried by a jury in the place from the vicinage. So the colonists objected, but the government of England still believed that they could prosecute these people in spite of what the Magna Carta said. The petitioner goes on. As a result of these abuses by the British, proper venue in criminal proceedings was a matter of concern to the nation's founders. The founders cited the authorization of the transportation of colonists beyond the seas to be tried as one of the many injuries and usurpations attributed to the king in the Declaration of, the in of Independence. Consistent with those concerns, the Constitution twice safeguards the defendant's venue right. That's Article 3, Section 2, Clause 3, instructs the trial of all crimes shall be held in the state where said crimes shall have been committed. The provision was included to leave as little as possible to mere discretion on a subject so vital to the security of the citizen. In addition to that, the Sixth Amendment provides that the venue shall be in the state and in the district where the criminal offense shall have been committed. So in a state like Alabama, where we have a northern, middle, and southern district of Alabama, it would have to, the trial would have to have been in the southern district of Alabama. Now, you may be wondering why venue was so important. Drawing on the history, the petitioner said this, this results in grave inequities in the application of a constitutional right of first order importance. Great Britain's abuse of the venue rights of American colonists made venue a matter of concern. Federalists and anti-federalists alike recognized that venue right was vital to the security of the citizen because it acted as a bulwark against governmental abuse and the hardship of being made to stand trial in a remote location. But today, Criminal defendants who suffer the same violation of this right receive markedly different remedies depending on which circuit they are tried in. While some defendants will go free, others will be retried perhaps multiple times and punished, which is ultimately no remedy at all. So let's look at a potential scenario here. Uh, imagine that a defendant lives in Newark, New Jersey. Now, Newark, New Jersey is all the way on the east coast of the country. And uh, as a result, it's quite a distance from Twitter's headquarters in California. But let's suppose that Twitter discovers a hack in its systems and they identify the node and MAC address of the computer where this is taking place. And it's in, uh-oh, Newark, New Jersey. So they send out the FBI and the FBI locates the Wi-Fi node that's being used and they knock on the door and they do so with a search warrant and they search, they seize the Wi-Fi console and indeed it, it looks like this Wi-Fi console has been used to hack Twitter. But here's the problem. The Wi-Fi console, for whatever reason, is not password protected. And the defendant that they charge is charged in California and he's transported there for trial by the U.S. Marshals. Now, 
He was at work on the day that the supposed twi uh, Twitter attack occurred, and he could not have done it. He has numerous witnesses that can all testify that on the day this hack occurred, he was there at work doing his job. Let me explain a little more about why this is so unfair <clears throat> and the problems with distant venue. First of all, people who knew the guy in Newark are likely to know he doesn't have the computer skills. They'd be relevant witnesses and really should have been interviewed by the government, but certainly by his lawyer. Second, the people who might testify on his behalf if the trial were in Newark are unlikely to want to fly halfway across the country at their own expense to testify for him in California. And of course, the support mechanisms of friends and family are not there for the defendant. And of course, those of us who understand how Wi-Fi works understand that somebody who's nefarious simply finds a unprotected Wi-Fi node and then uses the unprotected Wi-Fi node to engage in criminal activity. And that could be a real problem. But a prosecution in these cyber crimes issues is significantly difficult because acts occur in one location and the crime results in another location. There are special circumstances that result when crimes are interstate. Just because somebody is in one state and the victim is in another state, you still have to figure out where the venue is correct. And the test that courts use is the, the actus reus, the acts of the criminal offense. And so that's where venue is determined from is where the acts occur. In this particular case, in Timothy Smith's case, the court decided that he could be tried in Pensacola because that's where the effects were felt. But even the 11th Circuit recognized that that was incorrect, that the, that the venue was improper. The only thing the 11th Circuit got wrong was whether he could be retried. They simply vacated his conviction. And essentially what that means is the conviction goes away, but it's as if it has never happened. Not that he has been subject to or has derived double jeopardy protections from that. So that's the issue that they are trying to work out here. Finally, the petitioner goes on and says, notwithstanding the importance of the venue right, this court has spoken only once to the procedures for giving that right practical effect, and that guidance is over a century and a half old. In Jackalow, the court held that the jury must find the facts required to determine venue. Consistent with that view, lower courts have concluded that proof of venue is an indispensable part of the prosecution's case, on which the government bears the burden of proof but this court has never addressed the quantum of proof required to prove venue or the consequences of the government's failure to prove venue. As I mentioned, the government gives a chance to file a response and the response they filed in this case starts off this way. Article three venues clause provides that the trial of all crimes shall be held in the state where said crime shall have been committed. The Sixth Amendment's vicinage clause affords defendants the related but more specific right to a trial by an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime shall have been committed. These provisions defining where a prosecution may be brought do not require that a prosecution filed in the wrong district be remedied by a judgment of acquittal that forecloses subsequent prosecution in a proper venue. By its very nature, venue governs only the locations where the prosecution of a criminal offense may be pursued after the offense has been committed. As a result, venue, unlike an actual element of an offense, plays no role in defining what, con what conduct constitutes a crime. The Court of Appeals have thus concluded that and consistently recognized that venue is not an element of an offense akin to that to define crime. So the government is making the distinction between an element of the offense that defines the crime and an element of the offense that they must prove, in this case, venue. So the question then becomes, how is the Supreme Court to work this out? It will be interesting, to say the least, to see how this works out. I believe that uh, the more conservative justices will side with the government and I believe the more liberal justices will probably side with the defendant. I think, however, in order to give the venue right the protection that it deserves under the Constitution, that you pretty much have to determine that if the government makes the effort to try a case in the wrong venue, knowing that they're in the wrong venue, 
because the acts didn't occur there, then they should be held and bound by the result of that trial because otherwise they simply take additional steps every time they go to different venues every time in order to secure ultimately a proper verdict. And of course, when someone is using the public defender or the federal public defender, that may not make as big a difference. But when somebody is paying for their own defense, if you're trying to defend a trial three or four times, you can very easily be up over half a million dollars in legal fees by the time you get to the third trial. So these are the kinds of issues that one would think the Supreme Court would take into consideration when ruling on this case. I don't have any idea how this is going to come out. Initially, when I read the petition and realized that they had taken the case, I thought perhaps they were going to resolve the split between the circuits in favor of the petitioner. But as I've read the gov government's brief in this case, I am not so sure that that will happen. There have been a lot of uh, amicus briefs that have been filed in the case, and all of those have an opinion, and all of those elucidate more facts and more arguments. We'll just have to see how the Supreme Court resolves this issue. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments down below. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and have a terrific day. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.